All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the September 16, Helping Those Who Help Others presentation on moral injury as a lesser known risk factor for suicide prevention. Uh, and thank you all for taking time out of your schedules for this very important and timely workshop. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, some great conversation and content over the next 90 minutes or so. And before we get started, just some reminders. First off, we will be asking that people try to hold off on any questions that you might have until the end of both presentations. If you do have some questions, please put them in the chat function. I will try to curate them, but unless it's something very timely relative to specific content being shared at the time, the presenters have asked, that we try to hold those off until the end, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible within the time allotted. Um, I also just want to recognize that th this is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, a number of activities happening throughout the month. And so we so appreciate your time in being here and all that you do in your various capacities uh, across New York State to help provide suicide safer communities. Uh, and with that being said, I'm going to introduce our two presenters in the order that they will be sharing their information this morning or this afternoon. Uh, first up, I'm proud to, uh, pleased to introduce Dr. Lauren Borges. Uh, Dr. Borges is a clinical research psychologist at the Rocky Mountain Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, also known as MIRIC, for suicide prevention. She holds an academic appointment of assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Her primary line of research concerns the use of contextual behavioral interventions to help veterans and healthcare providers approach emotions like guilt and shame more flexibly. She's federally funded to investigate different applications of acceptance and commitment therapy for moral injury and for suicidal behavior in veterans. After Dr. Borges completes her presentation, we are also pleased to have Dr. Daniel Bloomberg, who's a licensed clinical psychologist who spent more than three decades providing all facets of clinical and consulting psychological services to numerous local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies. He's the director of The Power Project, a 501c3 public benefit corporation that provides training and consultation for law enforcement. In addition to his expertise in workplace stress prevention and trauma recovery, Dr. Bloomberg is an authority on the selection, training, and clinical supervision of under, under, undercover operatives. His research intersects interests include police integrity, the moral risks of policing, and programs to improve relations between the police and the community. And I want to extend my gratitude again to both of our presenters who are a couple of hours behind us, um, two or three hours behind us in terms of where they're presenting from. And we've been planning this, uh, this workshop for a couple of months now. And without further ado, I'm happy to turn things over to Dr. Borges. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, let me share my screen. All right, so thank you guys. I'm, I'm um, really honored to be here today and share a little bit of my group's work with you. Um, so none of this would be possible without my research team. Among them are Sean Barnes, uh, Jake Farnsworth, Robin Walzer, and Kent Drasher have been like really instrumental in the way that um, we've conceptualized and intervened on suicide. Uh, this is supported by some federal funding um, and uh, definitely does not necessarily represent the views of the VA. So today, I, I, it's kind of a tall order in a short amount of time, but, but I figured I'd, I'd err on the side of over-inclusion so that you guys have resources you can check out later. Um, but first, I will spend some time introducing my group's conceptual model of moral injury. We'll provide some, some background about why exposure to, to morally injurious events in particular is a relevant risk factor for not only veteran suicide, but potentially um, for healthcare pro provider suicidal behavior as well. Um, and then I'll, I'll talk really briefly about uh, 
case study I wrapped up a couple of years ago using um, my group's intervention, acceptance and commitment therapy for moral injury uh, for a service member who was struggling in particular related to co-occurring uh, moral injury and suicidal behavior. And so this is, this is kind of um, where our model starts. So, so my group certainly was not uh, necessarily the first to, to bring moral injury to psychology, although one of, one of them was, and I'll share about that in a second, well, among the first. Uh, Jonathan Shea, um, many years ago, uh, was a psychiatrist, kind of um, shed light on, on this construct of moral injury. Um, and then Brett Litz and others, Kent Drescher actually was the, was the first um, first psychologist really to, to revisit this uh, with Brett Litz um, kind of in tandem to, to kind of think about um, developing a definition of moral injury and what it would actually look like to investigate this construct in veterans and service members. Um, so the way that, that I'll be talking about moral injury today and the way that um, my group really operationalizes it is that for moral injury to occur, someone first needs to be exposed to a morally injurious event. And so these are events where in some way you violated your moral code, either through it's often called like perpetration of the event. So through you acting in ways kind of directly that violates your moral code, your social values, um, or through kind of other people engaging in that behavior to you. And, and those are often called betrayal based events. There are also uh, oftentimes, and it's pretty common to see this clinically, morally injurious events that we would categorize as kind of perpetration based events, but where the, the individual engaged in an act of omission, they, they didn't actually um, physically do anything, but, but it was the act of not intervening that was morally injurious for them. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that today for sure. Um, but these are kind of some examples of morally injurious events that I uh, that were taken from the morally injurious events scale, which was the first um, kind of measure of exposure to morally injurious events in the literature that was published, I think in 2013 by Bill Nash. Um, and so when someone engages in an event where their moral code is somehow violated, right, um, they um, for instance, SAR was involved in the death of a, of a child in the war. Um, we would argue in, in our model that that's actually evolutionarily, it's adaptive to feel moral pain, to feel emotions like guilt, shame, contempt, anger, disgust, in response to, to violating your moral code, right? Like that actually means that you are human and you care about other people um, and, and, you, and you care about kind of your relationships with other people in, in this world. And, and this is important. I'm emphasizing this because this has a lot to do with how we then, we then respond to that moral pain and treatment and based on our, our conceptual model. So um, here then, if we, if we have this individual who has experienced a, a violation of, of their moral code, and, and let's say for this person, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it a little bit more in a second, but they engaged in something where they witnessed an atrocity and they didn't intervene. Um, and this created tremendous suffering for them. They, they experienced a, a, a significant amount of, of guilt, shame, disgust, anger at themselves, feeling like they're a monster. They deserve to suffer. And when we, when we experience emotions like guilt and shame, we have very strong urges to kind of isolate and, and disconnect from, from the group, which is actually evolutionarily adaptive, right? If I um, consume too many of the group's resources and we're thinking about kind of the survival of, of, of the whole, of the group, of the, of the kind of small group that I'm, I'm working within, um, it, it makes a lot of sense that uh, I would feel shame for, for that behavior because it's not kind of for the greater good of, of the collective. Um, and it makes a lot of sense kind of evolutionarily that then I would sort of temporarily remove myself from that group related to this behavior. But, but the problem is this doesn't work so well, well for humans and, and the way that, that we tend to get caught up and hooked by shame. So, so the problem isn't the shame itself, but how we're relating to it, how we're responding to it, how we're behaving associated with it. Um, and for this particular veteran who witnessed a terrible atrocity, and I'll, I'll share a little bit about what that was in a second, um, we, we conceptualize moral injury as those efforts to try and avoid, fix, control the guilt and the shame and the disgust and the anger. Um, because for him, his whole life became centered around trying not to have these feelings, doing everything I can to avoid these experiences, which made his life narrower and narrower and narrower. And he engaged in a number of behaviors that we would characterize as consistent with moral injury, kind of giving us sort of like a uh, a sort of clue, like this is this is a flag kind of for moral injury with you because you're engaging in these behaviors um, to try and kind of temporarily remove yourself, to take the edge off the guilt and shame that you're feeling. And so for him, um, after his deployments, when he returned, 
Uh, he uh, yeah, had developed a really significant heroin problem, had multiple suicide attempts, and this behavior was not present for him prior to deploying, um, discontinued completely his, his religious and spiritual practice, and, and dis disengaged from pretty much every, every relationship. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you're trying to avoid emotions like guilt and shame, and those occur in social contexts, well, of course, I'm not going to interact with everyone. If I'm trying to avoid guilt and shame, and I believe that I should go to hell for the things that I've done, and if I set foot in a church, I would burn, then of course, you're not going to go to church, right? That all, that all makes sense. Um, but it made his life so narrow that it didn't feel like it was worth living anymore. And, and so that's kind of when I, when I had the opportunity to start working with him. Another um, kind of functional domain that we see often, so I've, I've referenced that, that moral injury tends to be associated with difficulties in relationships um, with uh, just kind of disengaging from relationships with uh, difficulty practicing whatever that, that individual spiritual practice is. Um, but it also tends to be uh, associated with um, difficulty engaging in, in self-care, whether it be not making it to kind of like physical health appointments to take care of myself, or if it's, you know, something, something like discontinuing showering or just eating junk food kind of intentionally because I um, don't deserve to take care of myself because I allowed the, these terrible things to happen to these, to these individuals was, was this veteran's experience of it. So like, why would I invest in myself um, when, when I am a horrible human because of the things that I allowed to happen? Um, so this was, again, kind of from the perspective of, of this individual. And so for him, it's kind of like, well, how do we know that, that this sort of rises to the level of moral injury for him? And um, this is a kind of a working question in the field. Uh, Brett Litz's team is actively developing a measure of moral injury that I expect will be available in the literature in the next couple of years. Um, they've published a little bit on it already. Um, but, but for this individual, uh, he, like I said, experienced um, an act of omission where he, where he didn't behave consistently with his values. He witnessed um, a rape between an Afghan elder and a female villager while on patrol, called command multiple times, said like, hey, I'm in a position where I could stop this. I can do something about this. They said, stay out of it. This isn't your business. This isn't what you're here to kind of monitor and deal with. Um, so he witnesses this, this thing that is such a gross violation of his moral code, immediately experiences shame, anger at himself, disgust for not intervening when he could have, um, hides from other people, like I said, uses heroin to numb, um, completely disengages from his spirituality and everything associated with it, which is also his family. He was someone that had um, very strong kind of experiences of Catholicism growing up and, um, and, and doing, you know, engaging in, in the rituals of Catholicism as a family. So that was, that was really significant for him. Um, and, and like I said, multiple kind of suicide attempts as efforts to really get away from this um, sort of uh, suffocating shame. And we'll talk about um, how to intervene on that. So like, what do we, what do we do with that kind of thing in a second? And I'll actually use um, another different case example to give you kind of a flavor of what this can present like in other people um, when, we, when we sort of move, move through that. Um, but first, what I wanted to do is, is spend just a little bit of time talking about some of the research supporting exposure to morally injurious events as a, as a risk factor for suicide among veterans, but then also more recently in the context of the COVID pandemic among healthcare providers. Um, so there have now been kind of a number of, uh, of larger epidemiological studies that show that exposure to morally injurious events is not an uncommon byproduct of war. Um, so almost 30% of um, soldiers endorsed facing kind of ethical dilemmas to which they didn't, they didn't know kind of the right answer related to responding, um, which is a, a pretty significant chunk of individuals. There's been uh, a number of studies now that, that kind of demonstrate that PTSD and moral injury, while they definitely share overlap, um, appear that they could be distinct constructs motivated by kind of distinct emotional expressions. Um, and we know that exposure to morally injurious events now, those events that kind of violate my, uh, my moral code, um, th those events that that sort of call into question my social values um, tend to result in substance use, depression, PTSD, and suicidal ideation and behavior. And so related to, to kind of suicidal ideation and behavior more specifically, um, there was recently a study just published a couple of months ago where 
um, over a third of veterans reported um, exposure to at least one morally injurious event. And, and again, a, a huge epidemiological study. Um, and, and this exposure to a morally injurious event was predictive of increased suicidal behavior. So everything from suicidal ideation to suicide attempt. Um, and, and this was true above and beyond the severity of combat exposure, PTSD, and depression. So really highlighting kind of the, the uniqueness of, of exposure to morally injurious events um, and, and suicidal behavior. So there's there's definitely a relationship there. And um, I can I can we'll we'll talk about how how my team kind of responds to that relationship clinically. And then these are kind of just a, a another few studies that that show sort of that, you know, firing a weapon and killing in combat are associated with suicidal ideation and behavior. Um, and, and I think like the, the main thing here is while we have uh, phenomenal uh, in interventions for PTSD, um, they are not they are not perfect. And um, I, I think like part of part of the gap for moral injury is these interventions were developed in a lot of ways to um, to help individuals respond to kind of fear, helplessness, horror, and um, some of those fear based symptom constellations. And, and I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that um, these treatments can't be effective for helping Helping people intervene around guilt and shame, um, but but I would argue that these treatments weren't developed explicitly to address moral injury, and we still don't know how they work for moral injury. So that remains a, a research question. Um, but I but I think what's useful is kind of thinking about like, well, what is the relationship between between exposure to these events? shame if it's kind of self-directed or anger, um, if it's more of an other directed thing, and then eventual suicidal behavior. So how do we kind of understand that? I can I can talk about how how we work with that. Um, and then more recently, unfortunately, um, I've been interested in uh, in in how moral injury might be re relevant to suicide prevention among healthcare workers. So um, at the at the peak of the pandemic, and this this happened in New York, this to me was kind of a, a call to action on, on my part as someone that's already doing research in this in this area for war zone veterans, um, there was uh, uh, the death by suicide of um, an ER doctor who at Columbia, who um, her father reported, you know, she was just trying to do her job and it and it killed her. And now at this point, um, this is an area of research that's that's really taking off. Um, so in one study, and this was a European study, and I, I think Italy was was potentially included in their sample, although I can't fully remember now, um, but but almost 50% of, of physicians reported exposure to a potentially morally injurious event in the context of providing care during the pandemic. Um, so uh, again, the, the kinds of morally injurious events, the topography of it looks different than, than for war zone veterans, right? So instead of, um, you know, something like killing someone in, in war being my morally injurious event, it might look like like, um, you know, prioritizing one patient over another and the other patient dying and, you know, not having resources. It could like look like we're kind of in the process of doing a qualitative study related to this. So it could look like um, working with someone and, and uh, not and kind of denying them, delaying their care, because that's what hospital administrators told me to do um, so that uh, that individual who was COVID positive didn't infect other individuals. But, but that actually resulted in um, them not being taken to the cardiac cath lab as early and, and resulted in some like lasting physical harm for that, for that patient. So, so different, different like the, the morally injurious events will look different, but, but we're starting to see that some of the consequences associated um, with morally injurious events among healthcare providers and among veterans are the same. We, we see, we see this, we're seeing a similar struggle with suicidal ideation and, and potentially a similar struggle with suicidal behavior. Um, and so this is a study that I have under review right now, which I, I think is interesting. So we adapted um, a the morally injurious event scale, which was that uh, 2013 scale that Bill Nash developed to be relevant to healthcare providers because it has uh, it's uh, has some language that that makes it only relevant uh, to uh, service members and veterans. And so we just adapted kind of a couple of words um, and sent this survey to. Uh, 211, well, it was more than that, healthcare providers, but 211 completed um, this survey over the course of 10 months uh, during, during the pandemic. Um, and, and we also had them complete a measure of psychosocial functioning to kind of understand the relationship between exposure to a morally injurious event while providing care during the, the pandemic and their functioning. And we found 
um, that those providers who identified clinically significant exposure to potentially morally injurious events did not improve in functioning across time. So over the course of 10 months, they didn't report any improvements in functioning, whereas the trajectory was very different for those who did not identify clinically significant exposure to a morally injurious event. Their functioning improved over time. And so again, this kind of speaks to, to, to a potential sort of target, like how do, how do we help healthcare providers who are exposed to to morally injurious events, um, uh, how do we how do we help address kind of uh, yeah functional impairment for for this group? And so that all leads to kind of these questions about like what do we what do we actually do here? So so if I'm saying that exposure to a morally injurious event should result in emotions like guilt and shame. Well, how do we how do we help veterans and service members and healthcare providers and everyone else relate to those emotions more effectively, particularly in the context of what's going on in the world right now? So we have the COVID pandemic, and then we also have everything that's been happening on the news with Afghanistan recently, where a number of people that I, the veterans that I've already you know spoken with in, in the context of the treatment groups that I run and just some of the suicide prevention clinical work that I do are really struggling. Like this is not not an easy time for people, and I and I you know think in part of, in part it's yeah like seeing um, I you know was deployed to Afghanistan or or you know deployed to Vietnam and it was kind of a similar experience and um, and and what for <laughs> like what what was the purpose of of kind of me being there so so really struggling with um, with some of those experiences is what I've what I've heard from veterans so far which either is kind of resurfacing uh, previous exposure. Well, it is resurfacing previous exposure to morally injurious events that that may or may not have been have been treated so far. Um, so some of those people may have already benefited from treatment, and I, I would argue probably a lot of them haven't. And and just to give you like a really brief kind of landscape of of um, I'm going to be mindful of time here, but of the interventions available for moral injury, so there are um, four primary interventions that are being tested in VA right now. It's kind of all at, at different phases of development. There's Brett Litz's uh, adaptive disclosure. Then Sonia Norman has a treatment called trauma-informed guilt reduction. Um, and then uh, Shira McGinn has a, has a treatment that just focuses on one kind of morally injurious event, killing. So it's called impact of killing. And then we have um, acceptance and commitment therapy for moral injury, which I, I think takes a really different theoretical approach to, to the other models and certainly isn't inconsistent with them in, in other ways. Um, so I uh, this is reflected everything I'm presenting on with, with this particular case excuse me, in a publication uh, from 2019. If, and if you can't access that and want to check out the paper, feel free to email me after this. I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, but so this individual came to see me because of multiple suicide attempts. He had actually um, been on a PTSD residential program that uh, we are rebuilding at RVA. Um, and uh, he uh, engaged in cognitive processing therapy as um, you know a way to address his PTSD. Still had had a lot of guilt and shame and um, difficulty relating to that guilt and shame. Um, and and for him, um, really the the content of the morally injurious events, he um, had to use the intelligence that he collected. He was kind of higher up in the military to take the lives of multiple men, women, and children. So he would kind of befriend members of terrorist organizations and, and use the information he collected to take their lives, which you know makes perfect sense in the context of um, what his duties were in war, but but also represented a number of um, uh, moral code violations for him based on that behavior. And uh, his family history is pretty relevant uh, because he was married with with two young young daughters, um, and his family was still practicing a religion that he completely kind of disconnected from. He also had some sort of um, uh, really hard life events happen in, in the context of our work together. He had a friend who attempted suicide, um, which uh, caused him to kind of experience a, a resurgence and um, some suicide related struggles. Um, and he, he was uh, really like wanted to use treatment to to kind of figure out who he was again, figure out who he was in the context of having done these things. And he said, you know, my goal is to take off the mask. So rather than having to walk around life with a mask on, what would it, what would it be to actually take it off and and actually be able to look at myself and and also allow other people to see me? Um, so that was that was really kind of where we we started our work together. And so this is kind of what I already said. This is sort of the content of of these morally injurious events where. Um, 
he, like I said, was responsible for taking the lives of many people and, and kind of identified in the context of this work that these people um, were just normal people doing the best for, for their families. Um, and, and he was responsible for, for taking their lives given, given the war zone context. Um, we knew he struggled with moral injury, but he felt he didn't, didn't deserve his family. I am a burden to them. I should, I should just, you know, die by suicide because I'm kind of sucking the life out of them too completely disengaged from his spirituality, which is really relevant. We'll talk about how he kind of redefined that in treatment. Um, multiple suicide attempts, felt he was dirty and, and really didn't take, didn't, um, didn't have, uh, shouldn't take care of himself. Oh yes, slow down. I can slow down. Oops. So, for him, this is how we knew moral injury showed up. So it was a disconnection from his kids, primarily his daughters and also his wife, um, completely discontinuing his spiritual practice and um, and yeah, in kind of every potential way. And and even saying to me like I'm not I'm not talking to you about that. Like we're not even even going there. Um, disengaging from self care um, and and suicidal ideation and behavior. And so this is like what we're, I, I think this, this uh, diagram is, is helpful. It's kind of the network related to moral injury that, that keeps this, um, this individual stuck, right? Uh, so, so if you kind of think about this, he has some like sort of benign, what you, would, what you would think of as a benign interaction where he interacts with a daughter and then just experiences really intense shame because he's reminded of, of the children whose lives he's taken. Um, I don't deserve to be a dad. There's nothing good about me. There's no God. I killed so many families. This, this network kind of explodes and leads to, I should just die. And, and then the veteran attempting suicide. So for me, kind of knowing all, all of this, like sort of one event that is completely really uh, sort of objectively unrelated to the things he experienced in war, right? An interaction with his daughter, then, then kind of sets off this whole cascade that, that results in either ruminating about suicide or attempting suicide for this individual. Um, and, and so what do we do? Like, how do we, how do we kind of intervene on that? Our, our goal really is, uh, as providers, I think, is to disrupt this network somehow. So it's, it's to figure out where's the most kind of uh, efficient and effective path of intervention. Um, and this is a, a, a movement that's happening in, in psychotherapy right now. Um, there, uh, Steve Hayes and Stefan Hoffman have recently published, uh, Steve Hayes is the developer of acceptance and commitment therapy. And Stefan Hoffman was uh, someone that was really into kind of cognitive therapy approaches, but they've sort of joined forces and been publishing a lot on what they're calling process-based psychotherapy, which really all that means is kind of addressing the, the function of all this, addressing the variables that are responsible for all of these things kind of co-occurring at the same time so that we're, we're able to, to, to help this person develop a life worth living, which um, was certainly my goal in, in working with him. And so I, I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with acceptance and commitment therapy on this call, but um, I would say that we really have, have two goals in, in applying that to moral injury. One of them is to, to help kind of cultivate willingness to experience moral pain, willingness to, to experience emotions like guilt and shame for the purposes of being able to pursue what matters to me. So if we think about this, this individual veteran who, um, who ended up like isolating himself from his daughters and, and the, the tremendous pain that caused him, but he, he did it because his daughters reminded him of the, of the events that he perpetrated in war. So, so if we think about, well, what would it take for you to have a meaningful life? Well, for me to have a life of meaning and purpose, it would mean connecting with my kids. Well, why aren't you connecting with my kids? Well, because when I connect with my daughters, it reminds me of these terrible things I, I did in war. So, so the, the relationship I'm trying to highlight here is that, that often, in, particularly in this context, people's, people's values and their, and their pain is connected. As humans, we hurt where we care. And, and I think that's so important because the, the whole purpose of helping, helping individuals try to kind of explore this moral pain and experience it differently and be able to hold it gently is so that they can develop a life that's, that's worth living, develop a life of meaning and vitality. And the way that we address that and act is first kind of moving into like, well, what's actually, 
what is it that, that I actually um, am, you know, am putting all my efforts into trying to not experience and, and often with moral injury, shame is kind of the, the first piece of that if it's, if it's a self-directed morally injurious event. And so um, what would it mean, what would it mean to really open up to that shame? And so we have some kind of acceptance related processes and acceptance does not mean agreeing with it or thinking it's good or um, any, anything like that. Acceptance is, a, is about making space for my shame and, and holding it gently and, and non-judgmentally. Um, and the only place that I can do that is, is in the present moment. And, and really that requires kind of stepping back. And this is what the diffusion and self as context pieces are here. Stepping back from stories that I have about myself, stepping back from thoughts. Um, and again, not trying to change the content of those experiences because they make perfect sense. You, you did something that violated your moral code, it makes sense you would think that you're a monster, right? Um, so I'm not trying to challenge that belief. I'm, I'm trying to, to, to help them relate to that experience differently so that there's room in their, in their experiences for more than just that thought. So what would it be like if you could notice that thought and kind of look at that thought instead of spending your entire life just looking from that thought where you're stuck inside of that experience? And, and then as, as we kind of move through that, we're, we're doing all this uh, for the purposes of, of living a meaningful, connected life. Um, and really what that means is exploring what my values might be, what it is that I want to stand for as a person in the here and now. And, and so oftentimes that means reconstructing values. It doesn't necessarily mean that because this individual um, was a particular religion or anything like that, that he should practice that now that like, oh, well, you know, we want to target your avoidance. So go to church. No, like it might mean that that for him, it, his his connection with spirituality has changed. So so what might that look like in the context of the events that he He's engaged in how could he how could he reconnect to relationships with his daughters and and to spirituality and the other things that he that he cares about um, while again making room for for his pain so that's again really really the goal here is pursuing values pursuing what matters to me in the presence of um, my emotional pain my moral pain and I definitely won't have time to go through all of this today but kind of just wanted to um, provide like a little little arc of, of what we did in treatment together. Um, so I think the first thing, when, whenever you're addressing some sort of like a really intense traumatic experience, whether it be kind of PTSD related or moral injury related, um, is, to, is to really uh, it's kind of elicit some motivation and give some context about like, this is why we're doing this. We're doing this so that you can, you can have um, the kind of life that you wanna have because otherwise it, it makes the, the connecting to pain feel like, really like this punishing kind of experience. Um, so, so that's, a, I think, a, a really important place to start in this work. And for him, he identified that, that the things he really wanted to, to kind of connect to, again, were his spirituality, um, and, and that involved his relationship with his daughters, um, to learning and, and to leaving things better than he found them. Um, and so the way that we did that, we kind of did some work and values clarification. And, and certainly if, you, if you're interested in learning more about ACT, there are, there are a number of awesome, awesome books that can kind of provide more, more context about that. The purpose of today isn't to kind of fully get into that. Um, but uh, we, we then um, kind of engaged in this, this exercise that uh, through this, the lens of this therapy is called creative hopelessness, which which just means trying to generate hopelessness about my efforts to avoid and control moral pain, not hopelessness about life, not hopelessness about my ability to kind of move past it, but 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 to try to get to them to see that like these behaviors that you've tried, the suicidal behavior, the using heroin, the um, you know overworking, whatever it is for the individual haven't actually gotten you closer to a life that matters to you. They've worked really well in the short term to kind of get you get you away from this pain, but but maybe the issue isn't in running from this pain. Maybe it's maybe it's about doing something else. And so to kind of elicit that, there are a ton of like different metaphors and experiential exercises that are often used in ACT. And for this individual, um, we, we did this uh, virtual, actually, I saw him before the pandemic, um, but ended up seeing him virtually because he was in another state, which was cool. It was, a, it was a nice experience for me, like seeing that, hey, I can, I can actually do this work virtually, which has been tremendously helpful now. 
Um, but but we did this exercise in act which is called the tug of war, where you are imagining that you're in a tug of war, and we do this physically in groups with a rope, but you're imagining that you're in a tug of war and there's a monster at the other end. And that monster is representative of whatever your moral injury is. And it can take a number of forms. And for him, the monster was a younger him. It was the sergeant. It was the person in war that perpetrated these terrible, terrible events. Um, and he said, as we're kind of going through this, now I want you to imagine that you're in a fight with this monster, you're pulling on that rope. And if you let go, you're gonna fall into this fiery pit. Like you're, if, well, not if you let go, if you, if you, if you don't um, kind of win the tug of war, you're gonna fall into this, this fiery pit. He's gonna pull you in. So you gotta keep fighting. And he ended up saying um, in, in the context of this, well, I, I can see this monster, but I, I can't even see myself. And so we're, we're in this tug of war and he's trying to fight this monster, fighting this guilt, fighting the shame, um, to try not to get sucked into this fiery pit. But in doing that, his back is literally turned to everything that matters to him because that battle is consuming all of his energy. So in, in engaging in this kind of fighting this sergeant, he can't see his, his family, he can't engage his spirituality, he can't do anything else because it's all consuming. It's, it's requiring all of it. So we get to a point of like, well, what are your options here? Like, this isn't working. I mean, this is exhausting. You're, you've kind of been in this battle. Now we've been talking about it for 10 minutes and it's, it's exhausting, but this has been your whole life since experiencing this morally injurious event. And um, so you, you get to a place where like, well, you know, another option might be to drop the rope. What would it mean to kind of take a step back back from this battle. And instead of trying to, to fight the monster, making room for the guilt and the shame and, and, and still pursuing your values. Um, what would it be like to do that? And, and usually exercises like this are, are pretty powerful because it, it requires kind of a perspective shift to, to do the very thing that people have been spending their whole life uh, trying to avoid and control and, and not engage in. And so once we kind of elicited some, some motivation, um, the, the next steps of treatment really involves kind of different strategies and skills applied to um, kind of learning to approach shame. Like, what does it mean to like notice the sensations associated with shame in my body? What does it mean to, to notice the, the stories that, that my mind is telling um, about who I am related to, to this pain? What does it mean um, to, to kind of, how do I do that? And how do I get into practice of doing that? This guy was formerly a, a ballroom dancer. Um, so he, and he, he said in, in, our, in our work together, and I just kind of um, immediately amplified that. And then I think he felt, uh, he, he felt sorry he ever, he ever used that example because we used it throughout the rest of treatment. But he talked about ballroom dancing with his moral pain, which is like w such a beautiful example of what we're trying to do. We are trying to, to get people to a place of being able to, to have their shame, to notice it, to take a step back from it so it's not all, all consuming and kind of watch what it does and allow it to be there with me while still being, you know, the one that's guiding my behavior. And so that's, that's where his behavior started to shift. He started kind of exploring more values related to uh, spirituality, actually, and, and what that could look like for him now. Given the things that, that he's done, what could spirituality be for him now? And for him, it meant contributing to the lives of other people. It meant mentorship. It meant a number of things that then he, he went to start doing. <laughs> um, he you know, volunteered for different organizations. He kind of uh, helped veterans in the, in the context of his work in a different way. And, um, and so at the end of treatment, we got to this place of like, so, so not only are you able to kind of notice your moral pain and pursue your values simultaneously, but now you can kind of notice these stories that your mind set, tells you about who you are and who the world is related to, to these experiences that you've had. And so we, we did that same tug of war exercise that we did at the beginning of treatment. Um, but this time uh, at the end of treatment, it's kind of like a, a self-compassion exercise. Ask him to kind of watch the, the version of him at the beginning of treatment in the tug of war. Um, ask him to sort of imagine that he's he's watching this this him 12 weeks ago in the in the tug of war where with the sergeant with another version of himself. It's this kind of weird perspective taking thing. Um, and like noticing like, well, what's your experience of, of watching you, you know, in this struggle when you've now learned these other skills that, that help you help you to drop the rope and respond to this differently. And he said, my heart is breaking. My body wants to shut down. You have to accept who you are, which includes who you have been. So, so for him, it was just a lot of um, being able to kind of notice, notice these stories about himself and, and hold them gently um, for the sake of being able to engage what, what matters to him. And so this is something that I'll send to you guys. Um, this is just kind of like what, 
what the, the content, more about what the content of treatment looked like. And um, this ultimately addressed his suicidal behavior because the function, um, and, and not necessarily long term, but in the context of our work together, because the function of his suicidal behavior was to avoid shame, right? So if we can, if we can help him kind of respond to shame more effectively in the here and now, well, that that potentially um, that that potentially helps with with the need to engage in suicidal behavior. Uh, this is just his kind of value scores across treatment, which um, you know I, I will send these slides to you, and you'll have them to access. And I think that a nice quote here is he said, "I can value something without living up to it, to that value. That it's more about moving in the right direction than it is being or not being any particular thing." Um, Oftentimes in moral injury, values, areas of meaning can become rules. And once, and once something is a rule, it is no longer kind of this area of vitality and, and importance in your life. Um, so helping people shift, shift away from that. Um, and he said, related to this intervention, it made it so that I could connect better with that pain so that I could interact with it with more responsibility. And it helped me to identify with areas that I connect to and be able to accept that in my life, I will always feel a lot of moral pain and I am still able to feel happiness and connected to other people. So again, we're not getting rid of the pain. We're making space for, for responding to that pain differently for the purposes of being able to, to have a more vital life. Um, and, and then I'll end with this. I realize I've already gone a couple minutes over time, but, but the biggest difference um, this veteran said between ACT, he'd already had cognitive processing therapy for PTSD, is that ACT uh, for moral injury focused specifically on the idea that I need to accept what has happened and not so much try to reassign blame for it. With many other treatment modalities, it is focused on aiding victims and sur survivors to reassign blame and guilt for what they had been through. In my situation, I've been unable to do so because the facts of the matter are that I bear responsibility for the deaths of many people. This treatment was effective in helping me to develop my values so that I can feel pain without being consumed by it, and also focus on striving toward living up to my values and accepting where I am now instead of comparing myself to where I was or where I want to be. And I promise I <laughs> did not solicit that quote from him. Um, but yeah, so, so this is just a, kind of a little taste of our, our conceptualization of moral injury, the relevance of moral injury to suicide prevention, and um, the... Uh, intervention approach that we use. And now I will stop sharing my screen um, and let Dr. Bloomberg take it away. Thank you, Dr. Warges. Um, that's terrific. That was, uh, I, I think, hello, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you today. And, and um, I think the contrast between our two presentations will be at the end, we'll be able to talk about um, some of the starkness of um, where things are in this topic with, with the military and veterans in the VA, <coughs> excuse me, versus where we're at with um, law enforcement. <coughs> so I'm going to start by telling you about the sorts of things that um, can lead to moral injury in policing, uh, many of which are very different um, than what we have in, in with the military. I want to go over what moral injury uh, looks like among law enforcement professionals. And then I want to focus on my, my main focus these days, which is what police leaders can do to help prevent moral injury, as well as present some intervention strategies that law enforcement agencies really need to um, step up and, and, and begin to implement. So um, as, as Dr. Board just demonstrated, there is very strong empirical evidence of the relationship between moral injury and a risk for suicidal behavior from, uh, from research with military samples. And I'm um, reiterating uh, um, one of those studies that was published ju just this year, I wanna get um, really highlight that what some, one of the things that Dr. Borges um, went over, which is that this, this study, the authors of this study said, reports of potentially morally injurious experiences are prevalent among US combat veterans and associated with risks with increased risk for suicidal behavior, and this is the key, above and beyond severity of combat exposure, PTSD, and depression. This is the beginning of our understanding that this is a separate construct. And unfortunately, we do not have similar data for peace officers on this link between moral injury and suicidality yet, um, empirically. But those of us who work with cops are very well aware from a practice-based perspective that this relationship is very real. 
And I, I know that I don't have to say anything to this audience about the tragic numbers of suicides among the police ranks um, that we've seen over the past many years, which um, greatly exceed the number of on-duty deaths um, experienced by officers. So uh, if we sort of reverse engineer this, um, clinically, we know that many people who harm themselves are overwhelmed with, by intense feelings of uh, hopelessness. Many are overcome by guilt and shame or anger and betrayal. And as Dr. Borges said, these are the exact feelings suffered by someone who is experiencing moral injury. So my focus in this area is twofold. And, and on one hand, the, the main thing that we're trying to do right now is educate uh, peace officers and police leaders and mental health providers who, who really don't know um, much about moral injury. Those who are working with first responders need to learn about the reality of moral injury. And knowledge about moral injury and in policing is really in its infancy. Um, this is, um, it's very similar. I was thinking about this as I was getting ready um, for this presentation. And by the way, if you get tired of looking at my ugly mug, you can look at the painting behind me because I can't do the PowerPoint um, beautiful PowerPoints that Dr. Borges did. So you're stuck with me here. Um, but when, this is very similar to when I started in police psychology 35 years ago. Um, this is, it, it's very similar to the lack of awareness about PTSD back then. Um, there was, in fact, working with, within law enforcement agencies, a lot of resistance to even talking about stress management in general or more specifically bringing up the, the, con, uh, the concept of traumatic stress. It was looked at as, oh, well, you know, that's just a sign of weakness or we're not gonna deal with that. But now there tends to be excellent awareness of, the, of critical incident stress reactions and, and, and almost obsessive sensitivity among law enforcement professionals about the possibility of PTSD. Every cop has heard about PTSD. It gets drummed into them, but in fact, the rates of PTSD are relatively low among this population. Um, however, in one of our studies with a sample of police officers from, um, that, we, that we used from Europe, we got volunteers from European police agencies, moral injury predicted PTSD as well as its symptom clusters. So this led us to really start bringing up the idea that whenever a first responder presents with symptoms of PTSD, it's very important to assess for moral injury. And this is why it's so important to increase everyone in law enforcement's understanding of potentially morally, morally injurious events and their impact on public safety professionals. So far more common than PTSD, we see moral injury as a fairly widespread outcome in police work, just routine police work. So, and, and that's what, you know, kind of differentiates some of this from, from the military work. And that is that there are many situations other than obvious critical incidents in which officers may suffer moral injury. And, and by the way, I want to really highlight this too. I, I use, um, I, I've been talking about police officers and I'm, I'm kind of focusing my examples on, on um, patrol officers, in, but I don't want to give the impression that they're the only ones who face potentially morally injurious events. I mean, we need to increase awareness of how these incidents can impact investigators and detectives, um, dispatchers, especially dispatchers who are really underserved um, group, crime scene technicians, who, who are exposed to some really horrific things and so on. So, um, my other focus beyond education is what can we do about moral injury? And that has two prongs, a lot of which Dr. Borges was, was talking about with the interventions, which I think are, are you know, brilliant. Um, but we, we're gonna focus on prevention and intervention, um, which I'll touch on in a bit. So, just to reiterate a little bit and, and through, through you know, looking at it through a law enforcement perspective, as Dr. Borges described, the essence of moral injury is a violation of one's moral beliefs, values, or uh, ethical standards. And the events in which 
uh, these kinds of violations occur in policing do not have to involve actual or threatened violence or any exposure to a potentially traumatizing event, which is mostly where moral injury stems among military personnel. But this is also where moral injury diverges significantly from the diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Um, in PTSD, you have to have a criterion A event um, in order to be diagnosed, which is the exposure to, to real or threatened you know, uh, death and injury, life and limb, things like that. But a lack of understanding of moral injury and the overfocus on critical incident or traumatic stress in policing has left this large gap. And that's why my focus when I'm talking to law enforcement audiences about moral injury is to really diverge from PTSD and those critical incidents. So certainly moral injury can occur following an incident that involves violence and trauma. But to fully understand moral injury and policing, I think we have to understand the subtleties of these potentially morally injurious events. So let me give you a few non-trauma related uh, incidents that um, may routinely occur in law enforcement. Um, and so one of them, um, which actually is kind of a common law enforcement um, parallel to, to, the, to the example that Dr. Borges mentioned. Police officers get ordered to perform enforcement actions that run contrary to their moral values. And some officers that I've worked with have specifically talked about being ordered to relocate people who are experiencing homelessness. That becomes um, really weighing on them. Well, what are we supposed to do with these, for, you know, with these, with these people? Another situation is that uh, police officers may observe the behavior of a, a trusted colleague or a supervisor violating that officer's moral beliefs. And, and this could be something small, like accepting a free cup of coffee or some other gratuity. Um, which all of a sudden changes the way they view that person. They feel somehow betrayed by that person's behavior. The behavior of a supervisor would include giving orders that the officer views as morally wrong, which leads to a loss of respect for that supervisor who is now seen as um, kind of less morally upstanding. Um, but again, and this is even broader and what we've seen with lots of um, stress reactions um, and, and uh, in moral injuries among police officers is that the behavior that's viewed as morally wrong includes policies and procedures of the organization itself and actions of command staff personnel who are not the officer's direct supervisor. This leads to, someone's got there, someone's not on mute. <laughs> um, this leads uh, the officer to be, start becoming disillusioned about their agency's moral compass. They start losing faith in the agency as not being as upstanding or moral or ethical as they thought. Now, let's get to back to what, what officers themselves may do or fail to do. So there are times when police officers will do something or fail to do something that violates their core values completely independent of the orders of the supervisor. There are several situations like this. And, and the first that I'll mention is like, um, the behavior could be intentional, that the officer does something or doesn't do something without thinking about the subsequent reactions that might be experienced. So um, one uh, incident that I was told about was that the officer got a radio call and just kind of dragged his feet, a deliberately slow response to get there. And once uh, he got there, um, it was too late to prevent a tragic outcome. Now, you might ask, well, why would an officer do that? And this is where moral, there are other moral risks in policing, such as moral disengagement, 
or compassion fatigue. And these other moral risks lead to the behavior that results in the moral injury. Um, if you know, that my my big uh, uh, some of a very large study that we're conducting right now is we're trying to validate a scale, a moral risk scale um, that includes not just moral injury but but other moral risks because they they are connected to each other. Now the behavior of that officer could be unavoidable due to circumstances completely beyond the officer's control. So the officer gets a call and due to traffic jam, the officer doesn't get there in time to prevent a tragic outcome. Another situation is that as we know, uh, police officers are human and occasionally make mistakes. So they get a call and the officer chose the wrong route to get there and doesn't get there in time and a tragic outcome occurs. Or the police officer may experience just a lapse in judgment. So they get the call and for whatever reason, they go speeding to the scene and they get in an accident on the way there and they don't get there in time to prevent a tragic outcome. In all of these situations, as Dr. Borges mentioned, in order for a moral injury to occur following one of these events, that event has to be experienced as a moral transgression. So what will it look like? The reaction to the event causes officers to question the kind of person they are, the kind of person that a, a trusted colleague or supervisor is, and that moral injury erodes confidence in their character or the character of uh, a previously respected other person. That results in what could be an existential crisis in which the officer begins to question everything, their purpose, their goals, um, their allegiances, their personal relationships, which is also um, what Dr. Borges was talking about. And I, I kind of like to express it this way. When you, when you work with people who are experiencing PTSD, one of the really um, uh, strong components is that, that PTSD causes a person to question the safety and security of the world. And moral injury essentially causes a person to question him or herself. So let me revisit some of what Dr. Borges presented, but think about this in terms of first responders. The moral injury manifests in two primary ways. The officers who perpetrate a moral transgression through, through an act of either commission or omission may experience feelings of guilt, shame, remorse, regret, and conversely, or, or in some cases similarly, officers who experience a sense of betrayal from the moral transgression of a trusted colleague or supervisor is going to experience feelings of anger, disappointment, and disillusionment. It doesn't take Sigmund Freud or a pile of research to recognize the potential risk of self-harm in someone who is overwhelmed by and unable to overcome feelings of guilt, shame, regret, disillusionment, or anger. And this gets to now what law enforcement professionals can do. Um, you know, I think that cops or anyone in law enforcement who has experienced a moral injury would benefit from two types of interventions, proactive and reactive. The proactive interventions are analogous to what we've been doing for the past few decades with critical incident stress. For example, Following exposure to certain potentially traumatizing events, such as an officer-involved shooting or um, a mass casualty disaster, officers are mandated to participate in individual and or group, what are called defusings or, or debriefings, whether or not they want to or whether or not they think it's necessary. And why? Because the agencies now think that these interventions are beneficial in reducing long-term psychological risk. They've become ubiquitous. 
So we want to educate police leaders about moral injury so that the same type of response can be implemented for officers following potentially morally injurious events. Again, this is a tool that will mitigate long-term risk by helping prevent their exposure to these potentially morally, injur morally injurious events from becoming the experience of, of a significant moral transgression. Now, at the same time, reactive interventions are analogous to the psychological support resources that have become available over the years for officers who experience post-trauma reactions. So most um, law enforcement agencies have these things in place, uh, peer support programs, chaplaincy, um, and available mental health services, either through contract or through in-house um, psychological services providers. Of course, everyone associated with this, all the peer support people, chaplains, um, and the mental health providers have to be well-trained about moral injury and how to help officers who experience it. Because the treatment and the, and the response needs to be specific to these issues. So I think it's especially important for officers to have access to supportive peers. Um, this is a, a, move, a movement that has been going on again for the last several decades, peer counseling, peer support. Um, some agencies have them very specific to only certain kinds of, of um, situations, but uh, I think we, it, this will be a very value added experience for uh, those who have um, dealt with moral injury to help them through it. And due to the nature of this type of injury, agencies would be very smart to have a strong group of chaplains available to provide the support for officers who struggle with moral injury. But I, you can't just say, oh, let's bring in a bunch of chaplains. I mean, this has its own prescriptions. Um, we've written about this. Um, a colleague of mine is, is very articulate about um, being very careful and she's an ex uh, assistant chief here in San Diego and uh, has, has real issues that not every clergy member who wants to work with police officers should be allowed to. They need to be vetted, they need to be trained and monitored. However, um, chaplaincy among public safety agencies has a very long and overall quite positive history. So what do we do about preventing moral injury? I think this is where we have to begin moving um, very much more quickly. Um, on, a, on a broad level, our work focuses on demonstrating this transactional relationship in policing between wellness and ethics. Officers who are not maintaining their wellness are at risk to commit a moral transgression. And obviously I think we all can recognize that um, a moral transgression is likely to negatively impact wellness in several domains, um, including an officer's emotional, uh, spiritual and social health. The first step then is to improve officer wellness and resilience. And coincidentally, um, we have a book for law enforcement professionals <clears throat> excuse me, coming out in November just on this topic um, that's being published by the American Psychological Association. Additionally, uh, preventing moral injury in policing involves uh, assisting police agencies to adopt, promote, and maintain a culture of wellness and ethics and to see that these two things go hand in hand. Many potentially morally injurious events can't be prevented. They, they occur rather routinely. So some of the effort has to be directed towards strategies that prevent that incident from being experienced by those involved as a moral transgression. So in the examples I mentioned, this would involve officers demonstrating self-compassion and organizations promoting a philosophy in which officers are, are, are never expected to be mistake-free. Um, and, and we've been working to try to get agencies to fine tune their disciplinary practices. Um, I kind of use, I've, I've used and written about um, the analogy of different types of penalties like in soccer and, and, or hockey, where the severity of the uh, of punishment depends on the severity of the offense. And in some cases, the offense is just an accident. So a culture of wellness and ethics 
doesn't treat those through discipline. They focus more on remedial education and restorative practices than on, on discipline alone. Uh, one step towards accomplishing this shift in the organizational culture is for the agency to become trauma-informed and to implement trauma-informed practices, both teaching officers how to engage the public in a trauma-informed way, but also, and critically important, is creating an organization that treats their employees in a trauma-informed way. And I, you know, it's, we don't have time today to get into the weeds about how to accomplish that. But a key component of preventative efforts is to minimize the potential impact of moral injury. And to do that, the agency has to do more to prevent officers from feeling additionally shamed by their organization after an incident, uh, which may have by itself caused the officer to feel some shame. Now, some of these incidents can be avoided. Some potentially morally injurious events, the events themselves, whether or not officers you know, experience them as a moral transgression, some of these events can be avoided. This, and obviously avoiding these events minimizes the likelihood that anyone would experience it as a moral transgression. So this requires officers to be far better skilled at anticipating the consequences of their own behavior, which leads to another preventative measure. We have to change some of the ways that police officers are trained, beginning even during the hiring process, continuing throughout the academy, throughout officers' careers, during um, advanced officer training or continuing education, different agencies call it different things or in different states, they're called different things. Agencies have to do a better job at preparing officers to cope with moral dilemmas that they face on the job. And this should be done through rehearsal, scenario-based exercises, effective role modeling, which gets into a whole nother thing about who's getting promoted into supervisory positions, and post-incident debriefings where, where officers engage in, you know, the, the, the kind of post-op um, post-incident um, breakdowns of, of what happened. The job itself has lots of ambiguity and officers are bestowed with a lot of discretion. So training should have officers identify and solve complex moral dilemmas. Some of these training exercises should specifically expose officers to potentially morally injurious events and then have them contemplate their reactions following various outcomes. This would be connected, obviously, with efforts to educate them about moral injury so that they are, are, are more uh, cognizant of, of the potential impact on them and their functioning of what they do on the job. So there are more strategies associated with hiring, training, supervising, promoting, um, disciplining um, that we don't have um, time for to go into today. But you're welcome to reach out to me later. Um, I can send you some articles or we can just talk about this stuff. But needless to say, I mean, to deal with moral injury and to combat the epidemic of um, suicide among police, there are many cost-effective, relatively easy solutions that law enforcement leaders could do on a systemic level. But it all starts with establishing and maintaining this culture of wellness and ethics. But there is um, one more prevention measure that I want to discuss, and it connects with much of what uh, Dr. Borges was talking about, and that is spirituality. So to combat the moral risks of policing, including moral injury, there should be ongoing efforts to promote and strengthen officers' spirituality. And again, this is analogous to all the work that's being put in um, in stress inoculation training, which prepares officers to face and cope with potentially traumatizing aspects of the job. Similarly, a strong spiritual foundation can prepare officers to face and cope with the potentially morally injurious aspects of the job. I mean, I, I, I think it, you, it can't be stressed enough that a comprehensive wellness toolbox will include resources that officers have available when confronted with potentially morally injurious events. So techniques like self-forgiveness, uh, maintaining a sense of purpose, 
learning skills to, to exercise compassion satisfaction, just to name a few. I want to um, mention a study with veterans that was published last year that pointed to the importance of this. I want to get this right. Um, it found that problems with self-forgiveness and a perceived lack of control over one's life were associated with increased odds of suicidal ideation while perceiving that one was being punished by God or that one's life lacked meaning or purpose were associated with increased odds of having attempted suicide. But this is, the, I wanna stress something that else that came out in that article, which is very important because many police officers do not consider themselves to be religious. The study found behavioral aspects of spirituality, such as religious service attendance and other religious practices, may not be related to suicide risk as robustly as existential aspects of spirituality and one's relationship to the divine. So although it's an important component of intervention efforts, we can't wait to promote spirituality only after officers are already suffering. That would be like promoting good nutrition only after an officer gets diabetes or encouraging exercise only after an officer gains an unhealthy amount of weight. I mean, spirituality is not just a crutch for officers to use during tough times. It prepares them proactively to make those tough times less tough. So organizations need to see the importance of this through preventative lens and actively promote this domain of officer wellness. Agencies around the country are already implementing a variety of preventative wellness initiatives. There are wellness centers, wellness units cropping up all over in law enforcement agencies across the country. And spirituality can and should be a core component of these efforts. It's not promoting religion per se. It's providing officers with strategies to remain spiritually strong, such as gratitude exercises, mindfulness and meditation training, and so on. I think uh, doing so will not only help prevent moral injury, but it's going to contribute to reducing the impact of many other causes of officers' suicidal ideation and behavior. And I'll stop there so that we have some time to uh, answer some questions. Uh, first, Dr. Borges and Dr. Bloomberg, let me thank you very much for this extremely compelling uh, presentation on both parts. Uh, we've gotten a few questions already sent in, and I will encourage folks to use the chat function. I'll try to get to as many questions as we have time for. But uh, to start things off with, if I can find my questions here. Um, so, how can veteran peers assist in the process of healing from moral injury? I think that's a that's a great question, um, and I, I think like in part gets at. So I, I don't know that I did mention this, but the the grant that um, we have funded is a is a group based intervention, which is really interesting because we believe that. Um, for people to relate differently to emotions that are social, it, it requires kind of doing so in the presence of other, other human beings who have also had shared experiences. The case study I, I referenced was individual, but I think it would be so cool to, to get to a place eventually, and we're just not here yet in our research, as Dr. Bloomberg said, this is, this is still uh, very much emerging. Um, I think it would be very cool to, to involve peers at, at some point um, more uh, more closely in these in these groups and you know and and I think to, to bring in another point that Dr. Bloomberg made um, there, there's also been a, a lot of discussion about how chaplains can be involved in kind of different applications of, of act for moral injury would it make sense to have a chaplain co-facilitate would it make sense to have a peer that's very well trained in an act and um, has some other other credentials as well co-facilitate like how, how can we use kind of peers to um, to support the intervention and I think that that is a very important research question and clinical question um, that that I hope we can we can address and I don't know if you have anything to, to say about that Dr. Bloomberg because I know you work with peers just in a, in a different context more so you could perhaps kind of address that from your perspective too. Uh, you know mentoring peer support um, it's it, you it, especially with this population, these populations. Um, there's a, usually uh, 
an automatic resistance to uh, professorial types, mental health people, and peers who've been there and done that, um, who are supportive and understand um, in a, in a um, therapeutic way how they can be um, a, a, a real help cuts through a lot of the resistance. And I think that, that um, you know, they need to be monitored, supervised, well-trained, but um, they're invaluable. Thank you. Um, another question is up here. Uh, so a, a reflection that uh, Americans are experiencing a shared collective moral injury and wondering, you know, is anyone working on how we can begin to heal from this collective injury? Um, that's a, a big question and we might not have time to get to it, but, um, you know, just any thoughts or reflections from either of you on that? I mean, for, from my standpoint, um, one of the other moral risks that, that um, partly is a function of policing right now, but also is part of how officers are being trained, which we're trying to address is moral disengagement. And, and Bandura's theory that talks about um, dehumanization and the perpetuation of us versus them thinking, um, there's a variety of dimensions of, of moral disengagement. And so the, the, the breaking down the us versus them component is, is really what has to happen on both sides because it's interacted right now. And even in the community, it's us versus them. Um, the, with policing, it's us versus them. And we're trying to sit, change the way they're being trained and, and supervised so that there's less of that. But, but then they go into the community where, where they're facing that. And so there has to be bridge building um, and, and I, at the, at the crux is, you know, finding some way to, which, which is way easier said than done right now, as, we, as we've seen over the last many years here in the country in a variety of areas, um, not just in policing and community in, in communities with policing, but, um, breaking down this us versus them and saying, you know, we're in this together. Yeah, I, I think that's that's tremendously important, and um, it pulls on at a piece of your your presentation, Dr. Bloomberg, that um, really struck me. Uh, the idea of kind of maintaining a, or creating a culture, actually, of wellness and, and ethics, not not only in policing, but but I, I think in our country, um, has the potential to be to be so tremendously impactful. There's a real, there's a lot of um, cool research on an application of acceptance and commitment therapy that that was developed actually using Eleanor Ostrom, who is a Nobel Prize winning uh, econ economist. Uh, her core design principles for how groups kind of behave most effectively, like how to get groups to work together, essentially, towards a common goal. And it's called pro-social is the name of this intervention. Um, but, but this has been something we've been thinking a lot about from like a healthcare provider perspective, because the issue isn't just in the providers, right? Just as you said, related to policing, the issues in the system, the issues in, the, in, in kind of our, our culture and medicine and our, in our cultures as a, as a country in a lot of ways. And, and what's really cool, and I won't spend too much time on this, but it's one of my favorite kind of applications of ACT and studies they they used and they they've been using uh, they use uh, pro social in Sierra Leone to to prevent um, in small villages to prevent the spread of Ebola um, by kind of this group kind of adopting sort of shared practices learning how to kind of modify their their valued behavior instead of engaging in all these funeral practices that were um, transmitting and spreading Ebola, they they work together to kind of come up with their own set, their own like new symbolic ritual um, to, to prevent Ebola transmission. And they're doing the same thing in some of these countries um, to prevent COVID, COVID transmission and, and working together a lot more effectively. So so I, I, I think, yeah, to me, it's like, how do we kind of create a cultural context where people can, can work collaboratively and identify values that that a lot of us care about as humans and, and move toward those regardless of other kind of agendas. Wonderful conversation, thank you. Um, and a couple other questions, but before I get to those, I just wanted to also make note, uh, Dr. Borges, I think you mentioned a couple of things that just resonated with me and I think are really important in this context. One is that as humans, we hurt where we care and that's very simple, but I think eloquent and it's a good reminder in this work and then also, and this is a term that 
is often used, I think, but maybe not enough in suicide prevention in particular is creating circumstances of a life worth living, that suicide prevention can't be focused solely on preventing the act of um, suicide, but it is creating those conditions of a life worth living. So I just that really uh, struck with me. Um, this is uh, maybe a follow up, you know, what do we know about how families can help impact moral injury as it relates to their loved ones, whether they're they're in the military or police or, or other professions? Like, is, is, do we have any knowledge base about what families should do or should know or anything in that respect? So, so that might be something that that Dr. Bloomberg has um, has more of a more of a response to than than I do. I can talk about kind of just the ideographic individual work that I've done with families, and I'll I'll say um, to the extent that uh, someone that that the family is a supportive social community, it makes it it makes it a lot easier for someone who's struggling with issues related to moral injury to um, to do some of the work to approach their family again and re-engage in their family and reconnect in their family while still experiencing shame for the for the actions that they've that they've engaged in. So so I, I think anything that we can do to kind of provide education to family members and um and and sort of what it means to kind of create a a, a supportive context would be would be really useful. Um, I'm not personally aware of any work that's that's like explicitly being done in, in that area right now related to to veterans, but I think it's really important. And there, um, I, I don't know of any work being done with with police. However, our our, our book that's coming out and um, our efforts in this area focus on not just what to do to get better when you're not well, but how to stay healthy, and and that involves and we have lots of exercises and ideas of engaging the family, maintaining balance. Um, focusing on identity as not just a police officer, but as a father, husband, wife, you know, and, and, and having a, a balanced life. Um, and one of the efforts, at least that some of the agencies are doing is training in as part of the wellness programming, the family members. And so to look what to look out for early warning signs and, and improving communication, um, and not just this, this, this idea of I don't want to bring work home, um, trying to get over that within the officers so that they are sharing, that they're not isolating. So using the family as a, another preventative, and, and we talk in the book, hey, you, you may be single, you may not have, be, have close relations with your families, but create a surrogate family. So we're not just talking about relatives. We have to have you know, a surrogate family, a support system, um, that is going to hold you accountable, basically, for when you start to slip, and they're going to catch you on it before you, you really um, hit the bottom, hit rock bottom. Great. Uh, I, I think, Dr. Bloomberg, you may have mentioned this, and perhaps you did, Dr. Borges, but would it be fair to say using, say, academy for law enforcement or boot camp for military, that the idea of uh, moral injury should be baked into all the other tools of the trade, so to speak. Um, you know, some operational understanding of what moral injury is and how to mitigate it. So, for best practices, it seems like that would be the idea or one of the ideal um, add-ons. We we have been pushing that just as much as we talk about um, you know identifying. Uh, what a critical incident is and, and traumatic stress is as a result of exposure to traumatic events is the idea of moral injury and being able to um, know that your behavior will have consequences without second guessing, without trying to get, slow you down. It's a repetitive thing so that um, there's a lot more ambiguity. The difference between military deployments and routine policing is the amount of ambiguity that officers face on a daily basis and all this discretion where they don't exactly always know what the mission is. And so training in an adult learning model and creating divergent thinking and creative thinking and, and being able to, to think on your own and being able to know what the possible outcomes will be of your use of discretion, um, and their impact on you. 
is part needs to be part of not just the academy training, but but um, you know throughout um, field training and ongoing continuing education. I think that um, a, like a piece of that that will be really important um, is is really highlighting uh, kind of like how how it can be true for an individual that the values of, um, I don't know, the police force or the values of the military may completely not be aligned with, with their own personal values and in, in some of the in some of the situations that they face. And, and what does that mean to kind of hold both of those things at, at the same time? And I know that's been that's been consequential for some of the um, the work that we've we've done in, in war zone veterans, and I could imagine that that would that would be important in policing. Is like, well, what does it mean if my own personal values are are divergent in some ways from kind of the values of of the academy and the specific situation that I'm that I'm put into? And like, which do I which do I choose to act on? And likely it will be that I chose to act on these these values that are consistent with the academy. And and what does that what does that actually mean? And how do I kind of make space for that? In, in law enforcement, one of the things that we've been trying to do is, is help people understand that not everyone is best suited for every single assignment. So yeah, yeah. Um, that, that the cool. idea would be that, you know, getting into child abuse, uh, a child, as a child abuse detective is not for everyone. A homicide detective is not for everyone. Um, getting on specialized units is not for everyone. That understanding that this is not a career path necessarily that's right for you, but that doesn't mean that there aren't other things that, that will be very available to you. And knowing yourself and knowing and, and being very well aware of what the dynamics will be for you, not just behaviorally, professionally, but psychologically and morally in the behavior that you'll be required to do in this assignment. And the education process helps people, I think, have their eyes open and that's going to minimize the impacts. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, as, as we're bumping up against time, uh, a couple of folks have asked if you wouldn't mind sharing your emails in the chat box. Oh, and sure. please also know for folks who are on the call that we will uh, we are archiving this presentation and it will be posted on our website and for folks uh, who registered for this, we will also make sure we get the archived recording and the slide deck sent out. So that'll also have contact information. Uh, I do want to be mindful of folks' time. And again, want to thank Dr. Borges and Dr. Bloomberg for the wonderful content and information. Very timely, very informative. And I hope that we continue to have more discussions uh, along the, the same lines of moral injury. For everyone who's on the call today, especially for those of you who are uniformed personnel, first responders, uh, active military veterans, thank you for the sacrifices that you make on a daily basis uh, for your communities and for our country. And please, uh, as an important reminder, take care of yourselves, right? Do that proactive self-care, do something that's restorative in nature. Uh, thank you, everyone, for your time, and I'm looking forward to uh, being able to uh, continue this conversation. Thank, thank you, all. you all. I really appreciated it. Bye.